Now, Psalm 12, verses 6 to 7. Let us read together. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. May God bless the reading of his word. Let us all turn to God in prayer. Eternal God, our gracious, loving, heavenly Father, we thank you for drawing us to thy house in this great privilege to worship you, and we pray that even you would use this BBK lesson to establish the understanding of how we received your words, and especially to establish your church to be strong, to defend, and to stand up for your holy Bible, and that each worshipper, each hearer here, would not just understand, but would truly love your word, to obey it, and to defend it when attacked. So Lord, be with us, grant to us understanding from above, grant to us conviction in our hearts. Lord, we pray and ask for all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, when we think of the Bible, we see so many versions, right, today? So many different versions of the Bible. Now, what is the background to which we got all these Bibles? And we also know that there has been a huge battle on certain doctrines about the Bible regarding is the Bible perfect? Is the Bible preserved? This has even split Christendom for many centuries. And then, not too long ago, it began to split even the Bible Presbyterian movement. So please know that this attack on the Bible does not end. Now, I have given you a piece of paper. Please pick it up from the back if you don't have. That explains how we get the Bible and all the different versions, especially the English versions. All right? Now, it's for you to keep. But at this point, I want you to just pay attention first. All right? Pay attention to, to what I'm going to explain up here so that you have an overall picture, right? So don't worry about the piece of paper. Understand what I'm trying to explain in the overall picture first. When you read it later on on your own, it becomes clearer, all right? So don't get distracted with the paper. I'm trying to explain to you the big picture of the paper and then the details. Now, oh, before, before that, we always must do revision, right? Now, what is the Bible? The Bible is... God's Word. Always remember, the Bible is God's Word, not the words of men. You may see Paul, Peter, and all that. It is not their words. These are the inspired words of God when God moved them to write. So the Bible is God's Word. It is inerrant, means no errors. In, fallible, means cannot make errors. And these are what? Very good. Divinely inspired. Now, it's inerrant and infallible because it is inspired by God. Huh? That's why it's without error. And then another one? Very good. Perfectly preserved. Perfectly preserved. Preserved, no use if there are errors. So because it's inerrant, infallible, it must be perfectly preserved, right? And then, but the Bible says... The, the Word of God says that it is from this generation forever. Then, for us. Very good, for us. From this generation is for us. And through eternity, right? All right? Through eternity. Okay, so uh, forever. Okay, forever. Now, for us, through eternity or forever, always God's word. So remember this, because when you look at the verse that we read, the words are pure. Silver tried in earth, purified seven times. Purified means 
it is made pure. Seven times you refer to perfection. That's why it's perfect. All right? It is pure because it's from God. And it's perfectly preserved, purified seven times. Then God says, Thou shalt preserve them, thou shalt keep them. All right? Shall thou keep them, thou shalt preserve them. That is where we get preservation. Thou shalt means God will definitely do so throughout eternity, all the time. Now, with that, we want to study how we got the Bible. And if we look, now we have, well, we know the original Bible, the, or, or the original words of God is written on stones, written on animal skins, and written on papyrus. All right, original, original. So, when the these are in the original languages original languages all right which is um he hebrew by and large for old testament greek for the new testament all right now so this is the original so when moses wrote the ten commandments god fingered the ten commandments on stones now are those stones here of course not now this Learn this word. These are called autographs. All right? Understand this. The autographs. Autographs means the very original copy. The very original copy. Autograph. Now then today we have many modern English versions. NIV, RSV, uh, CU, uh, uh, the Chinese, for example, CUV. So many modern English versions that we know of. And then we also have uh, the King James Version. So two questions. How do we end up with these versions in English? Because the autographs are in the original languages. And how do we end up, second question, with so many versions? Today, when you do a Bible verse search, you'll find that the websites will give you, and so many, you keep scrolling, 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 and then somewhere in between, KJV, then many other versions. Why so many? How? Now, of course, these are, are lost. These are lost. Now, over time, as these are written, so for example, you see, we read First Peter. Oh, we are studying Philippians. Paul just wrote in Greek that piece of paper, and then it got delivered to the church and read to the church. That piece is called autograph. Now, then the church, or in the Old Testament, the people of God, they want to have their own, so they copy. When it is read, they copy, all right? So copies were made. People would copy books of the Bible for themselves or they make many copies, sort of copies. Now, those copies of the original, so what Moses said on, on the stones, and over time, it just get copied, all right? Now, so from stones to, as, as technology developed, to animal skins, to papyrus, and so on. Now, these are called apographs. So now you know. The autographs were copied, and then people had copies of it called apographs. The apographs are still in the original languages. All right? Not this yet. So in the original languages. Now, so they copied the copies, and then many copies. Right, many, many copies, many, many copies, and so on. So this is how these hand-copied things get, it grows over time, from church, from people to people, from church to church, and so on. Now, when these things are copied, then over time, there is the need and the desire to have it in a language that people understood. Now, especially as we have studied in the Reformation, there were people that, the reformers, that said, well, you know, all these are in the original languages. And the Roman Catholic Church said you cannot read. Now, the Roman Catholic Church also translated into Latin. They made Latin translations. But they told people, you can't read it. You're not allowed to read it. 
Then at Reformation, the reformers say, we want to make sure that the people, the common people, will know God's word in their own language. Because they knew that the Roman Catholic Church was deceiving people, and if these people can read the Bible in their own language, in English, for the start, they would be able in the English-speaking world, for example, others in the other languages world, they would be able to know the truth. The truth will set them free. All right, so now then they also, they began to translate it into English. All right, English, for example. We are just talking about English Bible first, all right? Just English Bible. Now, just before all this also, there was the printing press in the 1400s. God would raise and give wisdom to men to, over time, create or invent, not create, invent a machine that can print multiple copies. Now, these were, these were hand copied. So it's very expensive, very rare, very difficult to have your own. So God would raise people to create this printing press. Now, instead of hand copied, you have printed, mass printed copies. All right, but still in the original languages. Original languages. Not into, for example, the English yet. So the printing press allowed this Greek and Hebrew text, especially the Greek, to be printed. To be printed. Now then, King James, for example, we get the King James Bible. King James say, well, there are, you know, many copies of people's copies. And then there are also people who I want to unite the country and make sure they understand theology and are consistent in their theology. At least that's what he said. So he, he commissioned people to translate it into the English language. All right. So people began to translate, translate. Now, so we get this, and this would be in the um, 1500s, for example. All right? Actually, if you look at your diagram, all right? So you see the Greek text in 1500s, then 1600s, we see this 1600s, 1500s. Now, remember these dates. In fact, I will write it in red. So, about 1500s, about 1600s, 15 to 1600s. So, 15 something, 16 something year, all right? Year, not number of copies, the years. Now, how do we then get so many English versions? Because this, we end up with the King James Version. King James Version in English. Now, this, this line, this black line, this text, this text that they use were predominantly used, uh, found in the, as you see in your notes, the Byzantine region. Byzantine region. So, it was called the Byzantine text. Byzantine text. Now, and today it is often called the preserved text. Preserved text, okay? Why? We'll see afterwards. Now, notice that here, when people are copying, when people are copying, now, few things can happen at this, at this stage. At this stage. It's copied by human beings. Now, in being copied by human beings, there will be errors, right? There are two kinds of errors, by and large. One is copyist error. So, when men copy, they make errors. The second kind of errors at this stage was intentional errors. Intentional means there are people who 
do not believe in the truth. They are unbelievers. They do not believe in many of the doctrines. They do not believe, for example, that Jesus is God. So, even at those times, they would purposely change. So, when they receive a good copy, they would intentionally change it. Unlike those who are sincere, they copy, but they make mistakes. So, this do happen. This do happen. But God would use the church through the New Testament period, the New Testament churches. God would use men to ensure that not only that, now please, these are called the inspired, inspired copies, all right, so to speak, inspired copies. Now, in order for us to have the promise fulfilled that thou shalt keep it, thou shalt preserve it, keep it means God will protect, God will protect his original words, Protect his original words. God didn't promise to protect the stones and the animal skins. God promised to keep, protect. Don't let it be lost. Don't let it be corrupted. Thou shalt keep them and thou shalt preserve them. So God will make sure that the exact words will be available throughout, from this generation and forever, throughout time. Okay? So, these are inspired God promised to preserve, keep and preserve, then with, despite, despite errors made by men, despite intentional corruption of the word, God is able to preserve. Understand that. You must understand that preservation is a doctrine of faith. Because today, people who don't believe that, they say the Bible has errors, words are lost, because they do not have faith. They do not believe that what God says in Psalm 12, 6 to 7 is possible. Why? Because think of, the, think of the thousands and thousands of copies. Think of the thousands of thousands of men through the thousands of years copying. You know how, ma- how many errors they can occur? They say, there's no way we can have it. But if God says, I will preserve my words, then we believe it. So God, despite all these copies, errors, and people coming in to try to make sure that they try to change the word of God by their copies, God will give the church the wisdom through the church, the understanding, the ability, and God will guide the, the men and the church to reject even, even Apostle Paul's time. Paul warned them about deceivers that come into their midst that will corrupt the truth into another gospel, even then, all right, they were already experiencing it. But yet, Paul did not say, "Uh, you know, we give up, it's over, it's over. So many corrupted people came into the church. No, he was very sure. He said, it's inspired. You can put your life upon the word of God. Because when Paul wrote it, he was talking about Old Testament as well. Old Testament till then, well, already thousands of years. Paul said, don't, you don't have to worry about the copies error, intentional errors. God preserve it. You obey the word of God fully. How can he say that? Because Paul had faith that through the church, through the times, God would preserve it. Even when he received the Old Testament, he never doubted, oh, can I trust this? Faith, all right? So understand that. So, now, because of these errors, and the church used by God would know, not only, remember, not only just the words, the books of the Bible. Over time, there were corrupt additional books which the apostles warned and rejected. The church knew. And even after the apostles' time, the church continued to be able to tell by the, by the wisdom of God, and as they read all the different um, uh, uh, texts, they know which ones, which books. And they settle with 66 books. They settle with 66 books by the guidance of God. That is why we believe in 66, not 67, 68, 69. Now, but because of this, 
as the people understand and say, this is not a good verse. This is a corrupted verse. These are corrupted books. What did they do? Now, they would throw it away. They would use it. They would throw it for burning, for example. They would make sure that these are not used. They only kept what God has guided them as the preserved words. So they would throw it away. Toss it into waste bins, use it for fire, and all that. Now, remember this date, 1500s, 1600s. Now, then, it would mean that over time, there will be many waste baskets, many thrown away copies that, are, that don't, don't tally. So, for example, they receive, maybe as they go through the book of John, all right? And then they find that certain copies have a whole bunch of verses missing. So they found that, for example, a whole bunch of verses in John, in Mark, and like 1 John 5, 7, the verse on the Trinity, missing. They would say, these are corrupt copies. They throw it away, the red line. Now, and there were especially many of this found in the area of Alexandria. Alexandria was, Alexandria area was known for many false prophets, corrupt even in history, church history. Now, in this area, there were especially many corrupted texts, which the church in that area just threw, just keep throwing away. Now then, sometime in the 1800s, so remember, these are 1600, 200 over years later, there was a man called Tischendorf, right? His surname is Tischendorf. Now this man loves to collect manuscripts. He's not exactly a theologically sound person, but he just loves manuscripts. So he collected, and, oh sorry, so he was traveling. Now this is his own testimony, okay? This is his own testament, and these are recorded in history. This is not something that um, we make up, and so on. Now in his own testimony, he described that when he was in the Alexandria area, now he was in a monastery, a monastery, staying the night, and he found that the, the monks, they had a basket of manuscripts that they were using as, as fire, they burned, or baskets that were just meant to be discarded. Now, he curiously went to look at them, then he says, wow, these are manuscripts of the Bible. And he was very excited. Now, that is where he began to collect. Now, let me read to you his own testimony. 1864, he wrote this. And this is a well-known fact, all right? Not because we, are pres we believe in VPR, preservation VPP, then why we attack him. No, his own words. I perceive in the middle of the great hall a large and white basket full of old parchments. And the librarian informed me that Two heaps of papers like this, molded by reason of age, had been already committed to fire. So he said, you know, all this, many of it, many baskets of it, we've already burnt them. Now I say, what was my surprise to find among this heap of documents is a considerable number of sheets of copy of the Old Testament in Greek we seem to me one of the most ancient I have ever seen. He said, wow, I've been traveling around the world looking for old manuscripts. These are the oldest. So he believed he found a great treasure. Now then he collected it and he became quite famous. Now, but remember, he's collecting corrupted, thrown away, non-preserved copies. Now then later on, as you look at your piece of paper discovered in 1860. Now, it then got promoted 
it got promoted by two men, Westcott and Hort. Westcott and Hort. Now, these men use these Greek manuscripts that Tishendorf put together. They promoted it as good text. Good text. Then, of course, there is also Nestle Allen. So, remember these names because they are going to be very common names if you, if you open modern versions and you look at the cover. They will mention these are Westcott and Hot texts or Nestle Allen texts. Now, in other words, whenever you see Westcott and Hot texts, Nestle Allen texts, this is the history, the red line. Now, how do they put all this together? Because there were so many, so many. Now, in fact, that is how we eventually, I would just say it now, eventually get the many modern English versions that you have in the bookshops. So, except for the King James Version, I emphasize, except for the King James Version, of course, there are the other um, old, old ones that were translated from, there were other, other Bibles translated from um, this good text, but the King James Version, only the King James Version is totally, totally translated from this line of text. Only the King James Version that we use, to, the English Bible that we use today, only the King James. All other modern English versions are from this line, including, including the New King James Version. So many get very excited, oh, New King James Version should be safe to use. What they don't honestly tell you is the New Testament text especially, they mix it both. They mix both. In fact, they often actually favor this line. So you will see in their, if you have some of these modern versions, you will see some footnotes for certain versions. They put footnotes. Oh, the certain texts don't have this. It's not in the best text, they say. So for example, 1 John 5, 7. They will openly say, they will openly say, well, you know, this text, the best text, they, call, they like to call this the best text. I will explain to you why to them it is the best. The best text do not actually have this verse. At one time, they took it out. These modern versions, they took it out. They couldn't sell the Bibles. Christians got upset. So they added it back in, but they will still put footnotes there. Actually, it should not be there, but we just put it in. So the New King James Version is still using the corrupt text predominant. They favor the corrupt text. Whenever there is a conflict between these two, they will actually go in favor of the corrupt text. But they may put in the King James text, but they will clarify this should not be the case. Now, so this is how we get modern English versions and King James version. Because one line is purely from this, the other line from here. That's as simple as that. Okay? Now then let's look at some details. Now, actually, before I go there, by the way, this is why we use the King James Version. Because of the underlying text. Know that. It's not because it is, we like old Shakespearean English. Some people accuse us of that. Which is, I don't know how even they get that from. Because of the underlying text. Because how accurate a Bible is depends on its origin. Okay? Now, so, for example, here. How do they resolve? How do they resolve so many errors? How do they resolve so many errors? They use something called textual criticism. They look at the text, because there's so many texts, right? So many texts, right? So many texts, they look at it. Then, at that time in history, in the literature world, there is this thing called textual criticism, higher criticism, lower criticism. They, in the literature world, the people of the world, they say, well, is this written by Shakespeare or not? 
Then they will have a set of rules they use, they use to decide, is this correct? Then they look at the background, is this accurate, really, and all that. So they criticize a text in the literature world, all right, for interest, for whatever. Then Christians, now remember this is 200 years later, then Christians, Christians on this side began to say, well, how do we decide? Because, for example, yeah, how do we decide? Because you obviously know there will be many errors, because one copies for one verse, he made an error, then you have 100 copies, 100 copies times 100 errors, there are tons of it. How to decide? Now, they came up with few rules. Number one, they choose the oldest. The oldest copy. You look, how to decide? Well, choose the oldest. This, by dating, is the oldest, number one. That will be the one. Number two, the shortest reading. Shortest. So, if there's a verse that says something, and then there's another copy that has a longer version of it, they will just choose the shortest. And also, number three, they will choose the easiest. Uh, sorry, most difficult reading, most difficult. Now, why the shortest and the most difficult? Their rationing, rationalization is this. How do we decide which verse, which, which book, which copy? Oldest. Now, because they see, they believe that, you know, men, human beings like to embellish. So when the copy is copying a verse, I think I want to make this clearer, or I think I want to say something more. They will add. Because of the human nature, then the original must have been shorter. So they see many men, find the shortest one. So for example, the book of, many of you know this. If you look at any modern English version, John 7, or most of the modern English version, John chapter 7 to John chapter 8, now, this is about the adulteress that Christ forgave, this whole event. Because they say, well, you know, of so many copies, the old copies especially, well, this is not there. So the shortest version of the book must be the one. So they conveniently remove all this. Now, if you read the modern versions, if they put it in, they will also either have a footnote or somewhere in the back or the front, they will say these verses are not in the best copy. So they say best is like that. So they always say best. Or they say in the oldest manuscript. Why most difficult? Because they say, you know, God says things very simply. Over time when people copy, they not only add it, and then, you know, they, they try to simplify for people to understand Make it even simpler. So men like to change, like men, this is how men works. When they don't understand something, they, they'll make it simpler. So you say, then we must find the most complex one. Even if it doesn't make sense. All right? But this don't really make sense to us, but this should be the correct one because it must be complicated. So they use all this to decide in among all these errors. And there will be tons, of course. Now, if today I ask you to copy something, I'll pass it around. By the time it reaches those in the cry room, it will be very corrupted. All right? So there were so many. So for example, 1 John 5, 7. Now, in, the, in their translation to the modern English, in their translation to the modern English, and this is all historical, huh? it's not made up by men. It's, it's recorded even among themselves, they translate. There was one of the translators who insists very hard John, 1 John 5, 7 should not be in there. And there were copies here that did not have 1 John 5, 7. In the corrupt line, did not have 1 John 5, 7. Because already back then, there were people who do not believe in the Trinity. Why? Simple reason. Trinity means Jesus is God. Do not forget that. You deny Trinity means you say Jesus is not God. We studied in BBK. Why are you learning all this? For this reason. Trinity means God the Father is God. God the Son is God. God the Holy Spirit is God. The moment 1 John 5, 7 is to be believed, then Jesus is inside the Trinity, then Jesus is God. 
So the Unitarians means they only believe that God the Father is God. Jesus is not God. So back then in Alexander, there were already corrupted people that were like that. So of course there will be copies without it. Then in the translation period, the Unitarian was invited to be among the translations, translators. And he fought very hard and it's recorded in, in books as well that this Trinitarian wrote back to his church and said, we won a great battle today. I managed to convince the committee to exclude in the text we will use, for example, West Coast and Thought text, or in the, in, in the text that we will use to translate into modern English, I've convinced the committee to remove it. Chunks of the Bible, the last 12 verses of Mark chapter 16, also, well, if you add Mark, 12, 6, Mark, chapter, 12, uh, Mark chapter 16, 9 to 20, it's a longer version, so we should use the shorter one, right? So, now this is how it starts from corrupt text to be thrown away. Now, let me ask you, students, is the oldest textbook always the best? Sometimes yes, sometimes no, it depends. Even in school, you have many revisions of textbook, right? Many revisions of textbook. The teacher will say, you know, these old copies, there were some mistakes. Please buy the new versions when you come to school because we corrected those mistakes. Now, would you say, no, no, no. Oldest must be the best. You don't because you know it doesn't mean that. Shortest, most difficult, is it always the best? All these are human-made because they do not have faith that God will use the church to preserve. Now, this text over this side, over, let me use. This text over this side, I tried to use green, come on. Over this side, on this side, the green line, you will find that there's great consistency. Great consistency. Why? Because it's always been the preserved text from God. Great consistency. Now, the difference between this text and this text, at this point of time at least, or earlier on, people have counted almost 10,000 difference in verses, words, almost 10,000. So you use this line, there are easily 10,000 verses that are different or missing from the text that underlies, all right, the Hebrew and Greek text that underlies the King James Version. That is what it is. Now, how do we get the translations? There are a few things that you have to know. Now, from here, from here to here, from the original Greek, from the preserved text, all right, which today, I hope you learn, the Old Testament, we call it the Masoretic text. The New Testament, we call it the Textus Receptus, of received text, because we always believe it's received by the church, sorted by the church, and we believe these are the texts, all right? Now, how do they translate? So from, from the received text, the original Greek, uh, the Greek and Hebrew text underlying the Bible, the English Bible, there are four T's you need to remember, all right, four T's. Now, one is the text, the text they use. Two is the translators they use. Three is the technique they use to translate from the original language to the English language. And then there is the theology, theology of the translators. The four T's you must remember. So this will define which, how they translate it into the English version, King James, for example. Now, we do not have time to look at that this week. I just want to say, you remember these four T's and then next week we will look more into it. 
Now, then I close with explaining this. You hear things like VPI. VPI means it's verbal plenary inspiration. Verbal means they inspire God's brief words. Verbal. Plenary means all scriptures, all of it. Inspiration means it is given by God. Now, VPI is God inspired the original Bible in its original languages, in its original words. So that's inspiration. Now, please note, even for inspiration in history, there was a big battle. Some Christians do not believe in inspiration. They believe that the Bible has both God's word and human feel, human's words in there. Some were added by man's idea. So it's both. They don't believe everything. They don't believe that everything, plenary, every single word in there, including Bible, geography, places, names of people, age, numbers. We believe that even those were given by God. So over history, there was this battle for a long time. So don't think it's new. What is VPP? It's verbal plenary preservation. Now, then a new battle arose in Christendom. They said, all right, we believe in this, but it's just here only. God did not preserve, so it's fine. We, we go down this road because God did not promise to preserve. Then there's a big battle. Preservation is by faith. Now, do not forget that VPP, although it's a new battle in Bible Presbyterian realm, is a battle that Christians have fought in the Western world, in the Eastern world, for a long time already. It only arrived in our shores not too long back. There's a group of people who do not believe that God preserved. In other words, they say some words are lost because they are lost and we do not know. We need to use older, shortest, and most difficult. We can use man's mind because God did not preserve. We cannot trust any text. We have to now find out which are the correct words, which are the correct texts. Until today, scholars in this side, they cannot agree. Different versions will say this one should be correct, another version, that one should be correct. This verse should be in, another version, this verse should not be in. Why? Because they're still trying to decide. Until today, they're still deciding. Some of them have given up. Do you think that is God's word? Now, next week, we'll learn more. Let us turn to God in prayer. What do we have here? Top five reasons why church dropouts uh, what church dropouts say, why they stop attending church. Now, please remember 66% of, well, I take the American view, um, they are the most readily available results. They stop attending church at least a year after turning 18. So from